Yeah, I just want to talk to us quickly, talk to all of you quickly about um, how your brains lie, how they mislead you, or worst of all, make decisions without even bothering to really ask you at all. Um, so I'm going to start with some fairly kind of simple visual things, as a lot of which you've probably seen or experienced before yourself. Um, so in this case, if you just look at the purple circles, what I'd like you to think about is whether the one on the far side or the near side is larger. Um, probably needs longer than 15 seconds to really get the full effect, but looking at it, most people come to the conclusion that the one furthest away from me is larger. They're actually exactly the same size. Similarly with this room, the people on each side of the room look to be this side, kind of half the size of the person on that side. Again, they're actually exactly the same size. The people on this side of the room are actually about 15, 20 feet further back, but your brain fools you into thinking that it's a square room. Similarly here, it looks like a, your, your brain can't help but see this as a three-dimensional staircase but you can also see that it's, it's an impossible staircase because it goes up and down at exactly the same time. So in a similar way to the previous ones, your brain's basically fooling you. More commonly, escalators. We're all used to walking up to an escalator and it moves. So you stand on it and it moves, that's all fine. When it gets a bit confusing is when you step on an escalator and it's broken and it doesn't move. And it can be really quite confusing. Well, it is for me anyway, because you can often find it a little, bit, a little bit strange when it doesn't move. It's similar when you're on a train at a station, there's one at the next platform. And while you're sitting waiting for your train to leave, the one at the next platform leaves before yours. Um, and it takes a few seconds to work out which train it is that's actually moving. It's slightly disconcerting. Again, it's because your brain's trying to make a quick assessment. So basically, all of these things are caused in the same way. You get something like 40 million sensory inputs every second. So your brain can't basically stop and ask you what you want to do about each of those um, consciously. So it makes an awful lot of decisions on your behalf and an awful lot of things happen at the subconscious level. Um, which it does essentially to try and help you because our brain has, has evolved over thousands of years to, to deal with things like this It's brilliant if you get attacked by a tiger, which obviously doesn't happen very often these days But it's still useful in the sense that you know, you might have to deal with a, a bus crossing a road and so on So there was a, there's also attention as well as just perception There's how you do how um, we give attention varies as well so there's a study a few years ago in the US where um, a, re a Researcher stopped people on the street and asked them for directions while they were looking at the map two workmen with a door came in the way, a new researcher was hiding behind the door, the original one left behind the door, and the people with the map were suddenly faced by an entirely different person. Almost none of them realized that the person had changed because most of their attention was focused on the map that was in front of them. It's a bit like, again, more commonly, you've probably all experienced the feeling where you're looking at a book, and you read a page, and you're daydreaming about something else, you go back to the book and realize you've read a page and you have no idea what you've just read and you have to read it again. So that's kind of the difference between a, a sensory experience and an experience to which you actually devote conscious attention. Now the bit you've all been waiting for, so colonoscopies. Um, so uh, there was a study in the US where two groups of patients who, don't worry, they needed colonoscopies, both given, given colonoscopies. One group had just the normal um, surgery, the second group had the, the same thing, but um, the instrument was left in a little bit longer at the end. So there was less pain for them, less painful, but it was a bit longer. Um, and the second group actually found it less painful overall when asked afterwards. And that's what we call the peak end rule. The peak pain for both groups was exactly the same because it was the same surgery. But the second group, it was a bit longer and less painful at the end, so felt better. Now, if you're my age or older, you might recognize the guy in the middle. It's Alan Alder from, from MASH. Um, so he was doing a TV show recently in the US about memory, which is the, the next area where the brain lies to you. Um, he walked around a psychology lab as part of this TV program, and they kind of experimented on him at the same time. So they managed to convince him in the few minutes he was there that he, he hated hard-boiled eggs. He never had a problem with them before, but they convinced him that he genuinely had a memory from when he was a child that he was really sick after eating hard-boiled eggs, which was completely untrue. So why is it that your memory is able to give you these completely false, why are you able to generate these false memories? Well, it helps if you think as me of memory as um, a series of slides or static images rather than a continuous film. We don't have heads big enough to contain a continuous list of everything we've ever experienced. So your brain basically uses things like peak end rule um, and other similar kind of uh, heuristics or rules of thumb to say, right, which are the important bits I actually need to remember and where are the gaps? And things like the, the hard-boiled egg situation are where someone can actually fill those gaps. And this is where your brain's really clever, clever at lying to you because it convinces you that those gaps don't exist and that's why you believe these things are, are real. So the reason why your brain tends to do this kind of thing is partly efficiency. As I say, we just couldn't consciously think about all the decisions we have to make. But then that leads to the issue of, well, do we really have free will or are we actually just ruled by our subconscious going around making decisions on our behalf or are we basically zombies? Um, but the way I like to look at it is that, as I say, if you had to think consciously about things like tying your shoelaces every day, 
um, life would be a bit slow and a bit dull. So things like going for a meal, I'd much rather you know, be aware of what my subconscious is doing, but I'm quite happy for my brain to take care of how I use a pair of chopsticks or how I use a knife and fork, and I can just enjoy the food uh, and having a chat with my friends.